I knock the door as a follow up. The husband answers the door, and like lo and behold, like dude pulls out a revolver, which I'm like, dude, you don't have a nine? Like, are you serious? <laughs> and, but like, of course, it doesn't matter what it is. You're pointing a gun at the chest. I'm not playing games anymore. And uh, he tells me to come in, which like at this point, I'm not in control of this situation. Whoa. Um, Welcome to the Inside Scoop for Outside Sales, the show that dives deep with industry leaders to get you actionable insights to help field sales professionals like you grow and achieve more. Here's your host, Trey Gibson. Hey everybody, it's Trey Gibson, founder and CEO of Spotio, and you're listening to the Inside Scoop on Outside Sales podcast. What I'm hearing from listeners is that you'd like to have more conversations with field sales reps and leaders out there doing it right now at a high performance level. So I asked Travis Flores to come on and we'll get into what he's done as both an individual contributor and now a sales leader to be successful and share some of his knowledge and experience with you all. Travis, welcome to the show. And to kick us off, um, how about you tell us a little bit about your company, your product, what you sell and, and your role? As Trey said, my name is Travis Flores. Uh, I graduated Texas A&M in 2016 and came over to SRS Distribution. SRS Distribution is now the second largest roofing distributor in the nation. We actually started in 2008 and we work um, as a private equity actually. And so we started off very humbly buying a company off the, you know, the uh, court doorsteps in 2008. And when I started, there was about 140 stores nationwide and we were in about 29 states. And the joke today is that we can't even keep our PowerPoint up to date because we're now in 46 states and over 400 nice. Um, we work primarily, again, through acquisition. We do open greenfields as well. And again, we, we stay into the, you know, I'll call it steep slope and low slope roofing. Um, some of our markets, we do other things like siding. We've actually even expanded more to where we have Heritage, which is another family of companies as well that's on the landscape mm. side, and also pool supply. So now, believe it or not, you're seeing SRS all over your home. Rather, you're building a new home, building a pool, building an outdoor kitchen. SRS is probably involved. You just don't even know it. Um, and so oh. my, my time at SRS since 2016, I started out in the management training program or MIT, as we call it here, did that for eight months, got out quickly, um, which was awesome. And then was, had the pleasure of running, uh, our Aubrey store as an assistant manager. And then about seven months into that, my VP sat me down and said, dude, I've got vendors telling me that I, I have a, you know, I have like a wolf caged at the counter. What are you doing here? <laughs> He forced me into it. I will admit, I, I really actually hated the idea of sales. Um, <laughs> I interviewed with Sewell, who some of y'all know. And oh, yeah. I was like, I don't want to do that. Like, I don't want to sell cars. <laughs> um, and then I ended up selling roofing. So what the heck was I doing? And uh, <laughs> did that for five and a half years. And then January 1 of this year in 23, started as the regional sales manager for SRS. And so I'm located over all of North Texas. So DFW specifically. And then also Longview, Tyler, and East Texas. So that's just a, a little bit of a brief intro of myself and and SRS and who we are. Um, and it's been a really, really fun ride so far. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like you know there's plenty to talk about here because your story is one that many sales professionals aspire. Is is you start in one and and you work your way up and, and you reap the benefits of those rewards. But that's funny that you didn't even want to be in sales. So you. This you got out of of school a and M. I know you gotta gotta give the whoop or the thumbs up. We'll let you go ahead and yeah. do that. <laughs> uh, it's okay. So what you got into the manager and training program, and then tell me about like that time at the counter. What were you doing that caught people's eye? You know, it's, it sounds like you have a few times in your career where whatever you were doing was was catching someone's eye, and and that's really important. So let's start with that time at the counter. Yeah, and and pardon my French here, but really what it came to was a give a shit factor. And I say that because I think what was really cool is as an assistant manager and as a trainee where I was working the counter, again, it's really important. You're learning the operation. Like I said, it's it's roofing. It's not a very, we're not doing brain surgery. We're not building rockets for NASA. But at the end of the day, if something can happen in construction, it will. Those of you that are in construction understand that, you know that. And so I think what what really propelled me and put my face in front of vendors and it was that I was easy to work with and I would just never say no. You know, mm -hmm. I was going to inconvenience myself for the customer. And as a as an assistant manager, you know, that looked like opening the store on a Saturday. Um, I'll never forget mm -hmm. before I was married, um, my parents had come up to visit for Mother's Day. And after we went to church and went to lunch, I actually told my mom, I was like, hey, I'm really sorry. I have to go to work. Most people are not like, Wow. 
probably of the hundred and something employees we had in DFW at that time, uh, I'm going to promise you not a single person was at work that day besides <laughs> myself, but I was trying to make sure that the promises I had made the customer were followed through on. I, I knew in that moment it was my responsibility to make it happen. And of course you hear the cliche things under promise over deliver, but mm -hmm. for me it was like, th this is something that I'm building that like, yeah. And are my efforts really going that far with this one customer and this one opportunity on a Sunday, mother's day of 2017, maybe, maybe not. I don't know. But at the end of the day, I, I was thinking long-term, right? Like it's important, yeah. to, but I was thinking, where am I going to be three years down the road? Absolutely. And it was, a, it was going to be an accumulation of actions like that that were going to help propel me. And um, yeah, fortunately enough, it, it made an impact. And somebody said, Hey, this, this guy will be a stud. And um, I just worked really hard. I didn't, I didn't think I was the most talented guy. I still don't. Um, I just have that kind of mindset of like, the job's not finished. I'm going to keep doing this until, you know, until the bell rings. So yeah, that's great. So your, your manager sits you down and says, Travis, I got an idea for you. Let's, what do you think about the sales role, which is um, uh, territory manager? Is that, is that what it's called? Yes, okay. Sir. So, and then what, what did you think about that? You're like, you said you weren't real into it. So how did that conversation go? You're like, I don't know. I kind of like what I'm doing here. Or... Yeah. So I was, uh, at the time I was 23. Yeah. I was not quite 24. So my first thought was, Hey, construction's a good old boy thing, right? Like you, you know, your daddy did this. So, you know, that guy and you know, mm. that. and I'm like, I don't have any of those relationships. I'm from Austin, Texas, was born in California, but my family's roots are not very strong in Texas. So I don't have a list of 40 dudes I can call. Um, you know, again, I was, I was 23, so I didn't know what I didn't know. Um, but of course, at that age, you know, your senior vice president that's over 200 branches sits you down mm. up to the store and you're kind of shaking in your boots. Like, I'm just going to say, yes, sir. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think what really changed is he said, look, you're not going to get fired. Like I, I do like the performance you have. And luckily that year we were actually the, uh, the branch of the year, which was really, mm, that's um, nice. Yeah. It was a really great accomplishment, but he was very honest with me where he said, Hey, like looking down the pipe right now, it'll probably be 18 months before I could make you a branch manager, which is really what I had wanted at the time. Mm. And he said, or you have a real opportunity to have probably the most fun job in the company and make some really good money. So he, of course, at 23, I come from a pretty humble beginning. I didn't have like tons and tons of money growing up. So I was like, let's just see what this, what happens. I'll sure I'll try it. Um, I had a really great young manager. He's probably, I think three years older than me or at the time he was. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I knew I was going into like a high paced environment with a good manager, not some, you know, hate to hate on those that are older, but I wasn't walking into a <laughs> guy that was set in his ways. I had someone that was going to adapt with me and be patient with me. And so I just um, honestly took the leap of faith and, so, and it was fun. I think that's a really good point you just made in terms of uh, aligning with that manager, because that's who you learn. Is that who you learned how to do this? Because this is a completely new job. You've ne never done sales before, much less like, you know, so is that who you learn from? Yeah, I um, I give that guy a lot of credit. Um, it, I actually did. Uh, if you're familiar with Southwestern Advantage, um, there's tons yeah. of people that I've done. I mean, like Rick Perry did it, the Papa Bros. Yeah. Did it. Um, I did that for a summer. So I had a taste of what sales was. Okay, like. nice. And I wouldn't even call it a sales internship because it's sales. Like you were going door to door, you were responsible. You know, they give you a script, they give you, you know, they feed into That's your hardcore. Oh, yeah. yeah they feed into your <laughs> emotional, if you will, because it's, I mean, you got to win the battle between the years there. Um, but no, as far as, as this role in professional sales, um, yeah, I learned a lot from that guy because I can, I can still remember to this day, we sat at a Buffalo Wild Wings in Frisco. He handed me a list of leads, which was really just, you know, contractors that were certified with the manufacturer and said, we don't have this business start here. And mm. like at that time, you know, we had, I, I, I don't want to knock SRS, but we had some people that had invested in the sales playbook. But the reality is a lot of it was between us because that sales playbook was being adapted for the whole country. And mm. again, those of you that are not from Texas or those of you that have been around construction, construction looks a lot different in Florida than California, right. than, Texas, than Washington state. So it was learning that from that guy who had been here for four or five years and understood, hey, this is how I can help this guy out. So you get handed a list of leads <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right which is just a bunch of names and so mm -hmm. what's your plan how do you how do you get started and this is key because like in any sales job 
you have to get started somehow. And there's a level of activity, there's a level of planning, you know, that goes into that. And and so I'd love to hear how how you got that kickstart. Yeah. And like I, I don't know if y'all caught that, but Trey made a really good point about it. there's a level of planning. So um my my grandfather in law, he says it's the six P's, not the five. So it's not um prior planning prevents poor performance. It's prior planning prevents piss poor performance. <laughs> it's a little bit of a joke, but that, that's really, to be honest, to perform at a high level, that's what it takes because, yeah, are there silver tongue devils out there that just, they have that charisma and that it factor? Yeah, but let's be honest, if, if you and I were coaching somebody right now um, who is a really hard worker, they'll never say no, they're not afraid to work long hours, they're not afraid to get door slammed in their face, like, sure, is there a level of talent that comes with carrying yourself in the right way, speaking at a volume, having a, you know, not aggressive, but um, good stature too. Yeah. But I mean, look, at the end of the day, I don't look like Brad Pitt. I don't have these gushing long hair and great looks like it's going to take hard work. It's going to take planning. So from like a tactical level, you you have to set your time up. So that's what I had done is at that time, I said, mm -hmm. okay, I'm going to, I'm going to start at 7am, you know, our, our, our branches are open 730 to 430. So my logic was if the branch is open, I will be out working. Right. And that didn't always work because some, you know, contractors, they work on their own schedule. They can take off at 2 p.m. But yeah. I, would, I would start in the, you know, I, I had a plan for the week of I'm going to hit, I'm going to go work Plano today. I'm going to go hit Frisco. I'm going to go. And I would, I'd have that on Friday for the week before. And then each day I'd pull up, for example, Dallas, which is big, but I'd pull up, let's just say West Dallas. Here are the 10 contractors I want to see today. And I just get after it. There was a lot of cold calling. So but my just go introduce yourself like, Hey, I'm Travis new to the area. Like, you know, just well, get in there and get in their face. I mean, yeah. My entry pitch was I'd walk in, obviously I don't have a meeting. There could be a guy or girl at the front. So you gotta, we could talk about that as a whole podcast of how to get past gatekeepers, but we'll keep it short here. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, my, my pitch was basically, Hey, listen, like, I researched you guys. I saw you had great reviews. I'd give them some sort of compliment. Mm. I you know, I exist. I, you know, I, I already looked at, cause I, I would do a lot of research. I'd use Facebook, Instagram, everything. So I'd see oh, nice. editor. So I wasn't dumb, you know, it was a cold call, but I knew what I was saying. Hey, I just want you to know I exist. There could come a time where you need that guy at five o'clock on Friday. Here's my business card. Wow. So nice. That's, that's all that happened. They said, man, I'm good. Thanks. Thanks for stopping by or were more rude than that. And sometimes they'd say, man, take a seat because maybe that first impression was good, right? You know, if I walked in the office and they have a chair, I wasn't that sales guy that plopped down and hand them a box of donuts. No, I, I stood with this posture like this where I was like ready to run out the door. Mm -hmm. I assumed they were busy. I never assumed I had the meeting. And in that moment, I wasn't, I didn't care about selling shingles. I was trying to sell a relationship. I was trying to sell the meeting. And I think when people get started, they get confused. They're so eager and they have so much commission breath because they're not making money yet. But I'm like, hey, time out. You're selling the meeting. Like when so you first important. meet a guy, you just sell the introduction. And it can happen in that moment. If they have time and they're like, man, sit down, then great, take it. But there needs to be this posture of, man, I'm just, I'm actually in a huge hurry, which I wasn't. I had no customers. Um, <laughs> and, and it was great. I mean, and then, you know, we could go into the follow up from there, but. Yeah, that's just, that's pretty much how I started. Oh, I saw there's so much good stuff in there. Like number one, you talked about planning, whether it's planning your week, where you're going to go, who you're going to talk to. You also did some research on what the reviews, right? You understand about that business. So you have something to talk about when you go in there and then you're selling the meeting. I literally had a conversation with one of our sales team members yesterday about this because so many salespeople jump straight to selling the product, the features. We got the cheapest price, the fastest delivery, whatever. It doesn't matter until you have that meeting. You're selling that meeting. Travis, you just hit it with a ton of super key important points there. So uh, let's go. Let's. I want to continue this because this is really, really good. Next yeah. step. So you get that meeting. They probably ain't going to buy then. Like, cool, man, whatever. Like, how do you keep fostering that relationship? And how many times did you find that you'd have to be in front of them to actually get their business? Yeah, I mean, you can read tons of sales books out there, so I don't want to sound like a broken record, but, it, you know, and if there's any contractors listening, I'm, I'm giving you a piece of advice because I'm telling you what you do to me, uh, but, <laughs> but I would say, you know, it takes about eight to 10 times, and this is yeah. really eight to 10 points of contact, if you will, 
And I actually, similar to Trey, I had a conversation yesterday with one of our reps who started in November. Um, she's been in the roofing industry before, but worked on the manufacturing side. So it's way different. Um, yeah. and she was getting really, really frustrated that things weren't coming to fruition. And I said, listen, from what I'm hearing, you've, you've only touched or contacted this person three to four times. You assume that after two lunches, you got their credit application approved, that you should just have all their business. And she's like, well, I'm just pissed because I'm third on their list. I said, newsflash, that's sales. You don't have the right to be their one or two because you bought them salt grass. No offense, who gives a crap? <laughs> they're, they're, they have so many free lunches. These dudes, by the You're time right. they, they had one full year, every single day, a free lunch. Ruth's Chris, Alt Grass, Lupe Tortilla. It doesn't matter, right? Yeah. So, to, to Trey's point of like, okay, now we've gotten that meeting. In that moment, this should be a discovery, right? The first meeting, yeah, at the very end, I got to close it. I got to tie a bow on it. I got to say, hey, what's it going to take next steps to, mm. earn to get your credit application? Get that. You got to ask. Assume the sale, right? I mean, that's 101. But in that moment, when I say discovery, I'm asking questions about their business. Like Trey mentioned, and I had said, I do my research, but at the end, so I know the products they're installing. I know the areas mm. they're working. If I'm lucky and they're pretty active on social media, I can estimate about how big their sales team is. But I'm going to say, hey, what keeps you up at night? You know, what's that itch on your back that you just can't reach? And some people, they're, they're going to respond and some you got to pull it out of them. But we should be the best question answers or question askers in the world. Mm -hmm. right? Like, not what's your price? If you bring that up in the first 10 minutes in front of me, I'm pissed. I'm like, are you freaking kidding me? And some guys will do that to me, right? Oh, sure. You can sit down. Hey, man, I'm just going to tell you straight up. You know, so-and-so was in here with X competitor, not going to name them. This was their price. What can you do? I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Can I buy you dinner before we get down to the dirty? Like, <laughs> like, I don't know what you need from me because the reality is you should have an effect. No matter what you sell, the, the reality should be, how can I teach this man to fish rather than catch it for him? Because mm -hmm. like, don't get me wrong. I think about OPEX all the time now, but the reality is you want to know what solves that problem? Sales. So <laughs> is if, if I can go and foster something where I'm teaching them how to be more effective about their business and know about their business by asking those questions, I can draw out of them what they need. And then that's when I can bring in the products we offer, the services we offer, because the reality is roofing is a commodity. You can buy this crap at Home Depot and Lowe's. If we're being honest. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask about. Like, how do you do it's how do you differentiate yourself? It's got to be on the service aspect, I would assume. But like 100%. Lowe's and Home Depot, like again, they sell 50,000 SKUs. That's just another SKU for them to rack up. Um, but again, even against like my top two competitors, you know, we're winning, we're winning the digital arms race right now. Right. So mm. we're, again, with, with an older crowd, they're like, man, I just, I don't like that. I like calling the branch. I like walking in. That's fine. we got 10 stores. Come be my friend. We do hot dogs at our Dallas store every Wednesday. So after this, I might have to go grab a hot dog. But the, the joke is that we are putting stuff and we're thinking ahead of how we streamline their production process, how we yeah. give sales advice. I mean, we once a quarter, we actually have a speaker that works for us come in and do a sales seminar for four hours about the sales process, how it works wow. specifically in the in the residential roofing, you know, storm restoration business. And his his, his seminar is literally called, you know, selling the storm. And, and he's so those are the types of things that we're thinking about that our competitors nice. are doing. And so obviously you stood out because you you got promoted. You're talking if you if you're if you executed what you said you're doing on a daily basis, it's no doubt in my mind that you're a top performer because it's unbelievable like how those little things add up over the years. And and it sounds like you and I are similar. I my first business was selling insulation to home builders, kind of a similar situation. Yeah. And I'm not a great salesperson, but by God, I would follow up. I plan, you know, all these things and it adds up. So I, I imagine you're a top performer, but there's something that, that um, I talk to people about from time to time, which is in sales. A lot of us think that the natural step is to become a sales leader. Like, okay, I'm a top performer. Now my next step has to be, now I need to manage people. And I kind of want to break that that preconceived notion because not everyone should be a sales leader. Uh, yeah. They might think they want to. So like, what did you do to stand out again, you know, for the second time in this company to order to get this next opportunity? And then as you thought about that opportunity, I can keep doing what I'm doing versus do I really want to start having be responsible, other people be responsible for my success? You know, that's a yeah. big step. 
So let's go into that as a two kind of two parter. Yeah, the, the first part of that was it, there was a huge walk of humility that I had to have to say, you know, I I can worry about my own efforts for the district or our region, if you will, or I can sit down and realize that I have a special, I wouldn't say gift, but I have a special attitude, process, work ethic that if I can instill just a little bit, just even 1% of that to the 25 people on my team that are on our outside mm. sales team, that effort will go miles and miles longer than my individual contribution. So there was a level of humility to say, hey, this is a step back financially, but it's a step forward in how I'm building up myself in my career. And just mm. a small, small tidbit before I get to part two, you know, I had mentioned earlier when I talked about SRS that we're part of a private equity, right? So everyone knows what that means. We could sell, we could go public. I don't know. Don't ask me. If you've done research on SRS, even you can probably tell me better than I will. Um, <laughs> uh, but but that being said, you know, there could be a, a day and time where the, you know, the, that bell rings, if you will, and SRS yeah. is public and, you know, maybe I want to leave. I don't, I don't know, right? And I wanted to have something right now where I have the ability to sharpen my sword, sharpen my ax so that the next job or the next opportunity I take, I, I can actually go and interview or talk to somebody about starting a business or working for someone else, whatever that looks like and have real life management experience, not just, Oh, I was an incredible salesman. Yeah. Think, you know, like on, on part two of that, you know, it's what, what Trey, what you were saying, it really reminds me of um, the last dance and those of you that have watched that documentary, Michael Jordan literally said that. I mean, we I, look, we are, I'm not here to argue LeBron or, or <laughs> what I'll say about my thing about Jordan that I love is he was very honest about who he was in yeah. kind of an asshole, to be honest. And he literally said that he goes, I had to tell my teammates, I think this is right after he left for baseball and came back when they won those last few championships. He literally said, I, I couldn't expect these guys to want to do what I did. You know, I mean, like, he literally fought Steve Kerr in practice. I mean, you, you think about it, that to me is a great contributor. Now, he learned to be a great teammate, you know, mm -hmm. he'll about right that he couldn't have done what he did. And they got better because he had Rodman, he had Pippen, he had Kerr, he had those guys. But to be honest, like, because sales is such an individual contributor, as Trey mentioned, yeah, I, I agree with Trey. I think there has to be a break in the mold that there, there are so many sales guys. Well, oh, I deserve that opportunity because I was top 10 in the company. Not necessarily right mm -hmm. where's your heart at in it like you need to have a real like gut check and humility check to say am i ready to step up and lead a team and realize that i'm here to serve them because there's days even today that i've got old contacts that call me hey man I'm, i think i finally want to work with srs and you know i start salivating like let's go freaking sell and i have to remember like no this my someone on my team needs to do this mm -hmm. it's not my job to do it i'm not there to be a glorified closer if that was the case then demote me put me back in sales Mm. My job is to be a resource and, and uh, my, my official title now is called regional sales manager. And I joke when some of my old customers or people at SRS call me, oh, you're a big dog. I said, no, RSM stands for regional support manager. My job mm. is to support my team. And if I can, if I can humbly walk and believe that in my heart and believe that in my head, then I'm going to walk in a level of humility that's there to serve other people. So hopefully that kind of answers that, that two-parter. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I really... Trey hit that on the head. I just, I so agree with that. Just because you're a great contributor does not mean you're a good manager. We could, we could literally spew out so many analogies of players that wanted to be coaches and they were terrible. Right, you know, yeah. Sports is easy to relate to. Um, but even professionally speaking, I'm sure some of y'all have had those ales where you, you know, you promoted your top sales guy to a sales manager and they just weren't, they were not Absolutely. the out that you hoped for. Um and, and then there's hard conversations that go into that, but you know, without getting ridiculously long winded on that. We hope you're enjoying the inside scoop on outside sales. If you want to hear more value packed content, be sure to subscribe and check us out anywhere on social at Spotio. Now back to the show. So I want to jump over to now that you have a team, what do you look for on someone that's going to be just a fantastic team member, whether that's performance or they work well with each other, like, maybe kind of the top three characteristics that if Travis is bringing someone on his team, this is what you're looking for. Yeah. I mean, I, I said this earlier. Um, I like to say it factor, but that's kind of hard because right. we could, again, we could do 10 podcasts of how do you define that? 
Um, but I think the first thing is work a full day. I'm looking for somebody that will work a full day. If that branch is open, you should be out. Don't make me be big brother and track your mileage to make sure that you left your house by 7.30 and you got home after 4.30. And look, with kids, with life, I understand there's days that come that way. But the reality is if, if we, I want somebody that I can feel that and hear that from them, that if the branch is open and there's a, there's a cat making an hourly wage in the sitting on a forklift, that's hot in the hundred degree weather, lifting 60, 70, 80 pound bundles of shingles all day so that your customers are served respectfully, your ass should be out there working. Yeah. And that, that is hard to hear in an interview, but that's why I like to ask a lot of questions as to like, what have you done before sales wise? Like what, what career have you had? What book of business have you built? And I'm trying to just let the record spin because that to me, where I can hear the it factor, I can hear that in the way they carry themselves and talk about it. Mm -hmm. Like I had an interview actually yesterday with a guy and, you know, the, the numbers he was saying, I felt they were overstated. So I actually interrupted. I said, tell me what that number really was. And I could hear the back pedal. Right. So mm. in that moment, I could feel that. And, you know, just that, like I said, work a full day is one of the things. And then as far as like seeing what fits in our team, I mean, again, like I want somebody that owns a room, right. We don't mm. all have to be, you know, in the gym, six days fit six, three. I mean, people used to joke, if you work at SRS, you got to be six, three and fit. And I'm like, no, um, mm. but looking for people, all shapes and sizes, I don't care. We're looking for people that are willing to, to, you know, pick themselves up by their boots, own a room, speak with confidence. Mm -hmm. uh, Y'all can probably tell I'm, I'm pretty loud. I talk really fast. Like we're, we're looking for people that have yeah. that, just that character to them, it's right? confidence character. Yeah, absolutely. And then lastly, like, again, obviously college degree is great. Professional experience is great, but I'm not opposed to a guy that literally you know, I'm just going to make this up, but his dad's not in the picture and he helped, you know, he got a job at 16 to help take care of his mom. I will take that guy 10 out of 10 because that mm -hmm. guy has added that guy's that guy or gal, you know, I don't discriminate there. They've had their back on the ropes. They've been on the ropes. They've taken the punches of life. How hard can it be to sell to a contractor? They're right. Scary, you know what I mean? Yeah. These are good people. They're, they're the working class, if you will, in my opinion. And yeah, there's tons of success and contractors come in all in shapes and sizes and professions, you know? Um, but that being said, like, hopefully that it doesn't feel too theory based. That feels more practical, mm -hmm. um, but that's really what we're, we're looking for in our team here at SRS. I mean, we're looking for people that, that have that mentality. And as a young company, again, we have decades and decades of experience because a lot of our, our senior leadership has worked for competitors or whatever. And so I like to think that yeah. we're the, the best because we've taken the best people from the competition and like, you don't want to work there. Like, <laughs> they don't have a future like it's all owned by one family or it's all public yeah you don't want to do that um and, and i think that that you know that is kind of the, the the charisma that we carry you know we used to have a last thing i'll say we had a we had a slogan that said you know tell them hell's coming and srs is coming with us right? <laughs> tombstone quote i yeah, mean come yeah. on so it's my favorite that, movie that, so yeah you know and again hey maybe we are more politically correct now right but <laughs> that's the type of attitude like our old VP, our senior or exec VP, he used to say, run, gun, get shit done. I mean, that's that's what we were built on. And and nice. I do think oh. that you can tangibly, by some of the stuff I mentioned, find people like that more yeah. than just like, how do I just shake a dude's hand and be like, oh, I just have it in my gut. He's going to work. Because the reality is that's not a process, right? Mm -hmm. So I, anyway, I could go on and on and on. So what's your communication rhythms like with your team? Like, it sounds like you have a pretty big team, 25. So like, yep. you know, w weekly one-on-ones are probably not a real thing, but like no. your meetings, how often do you connect with them? Like, that's something that, that first time managers may, is there too much? Like, I don't want to bother you. I want to let you do your job, but also I want to be able to support you, understand what's going on. So like, what have you found that works for communication yeah. rhythms? There's a, there's a lot of this, y'all can see a lot of phone, um, probably over, 50, 60 phone calls a day. Probably, it's probably more like- Oh, 100. wow. Really? Probably more like 100. Yeah, some are two minutes, some are 10. Just depends if we're, we're having a coach advice session. Um, but our cadence here is we actually have weekly branch meetings, sales meetings. So those are hosted by the manager. So there's a lot of support I actually give our, our branch managers as well. Mm. And because there's 10 stores, well, if you include East Texas, 12, there's only five days a week. So I can't be everywhere. Um, and those of you that live in DFW, it's pretty big. Yeah. Um, and traffic sucks. But usually my cadence with them is that each branch, I try to be there at least um, at a cadence of once a month. Most of them, I'm, 
recently in the last two months, I've been able to make it twice. I've intentionally freed up my schedule for that purpose. And so in there, we've actually given, I don't want to be too rigor, you know, about it, but we do have a template where we're talking about where's our growth opportunity? Who have we lost? What mm. do we do? Who's our, who are we prospecting? Hey, what connections do you have with vendors? How are you getting them engaged? Hey, you know, SRS has made a really awesome push um, to the Latino community. And so we actually have like, okay, who are you? You know, we have a few of our reps that are like actually taking courses through corporate to learn Spanish and oh, learn wow. Latino, you know, heritage. And we're actually making pushes to help those people, right? Because they're new to starting a business potentially, um, or some of them are also really successful, but they don't feel like their voice is being heard. So we have a target for that. We have targets for the digital platform I mentioned. How are we integrating that to our customers? Of course, then we go over stuff like metrics and AR and yada, yada, yada. But it's literally a one pager where, and we keep it short, one hour to the T. If you want to come and talk about the Cowboys, you got to show up early. Like <laughs> I try not to be the guy that derails the conversation, but really I think that that cadence has been really impactful. And then on top of that, you know, I'm doing ride along. So after we finish this up, mm. I've got a lunch with one of our veteran reps and a customer where we've lost business. So he and I late, like late last night, we kind of talked to her. I said, Hey man, like, what do we need to touch with this guy? You know, like, and he gives me the backstory and tells me for 10 minutes. I'm like, okay. So what I gathered from that is we need to do this, 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 no. Okay. This and this great. So that way we know that there's an objective in that meeting. Cause we never want to leave a single meeting. And this is my opinion of any mm -hmm. type of sales manager or any sales role you're in. I mean, you could be selling uh, soap for all I care. You know, we need to have a strategy of, okay, what is the target of this meeting? Because yeah, if you say build relationship, okay, that's cool. But what, what are we building it for? Yeah. Yeah. And it's not about, it doesn't mean that relationship has to equal dollars. I'm a huge believer in your customers should love you. Right. I'm not saying they have to barbecue with you on Saturday night, but we need to have, we need to have an intention there. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, that's, that's kind of Trey, that's kind of the cadence that I have as far as managing the team. Cause it is a lot. Um, and and yeah, a, lot a lot of people, people, there's a lot of texting. There's a lot of phone calls. Um, I try to be, how do you know when to call someone? Like, do you call every one of them every day or is this a, Hey, once a week, like, you know, how do you decide who you're going to call and when? So it's pretty cool. Um, again, back to a sports analogy. We also implemented where for that week, you can you will forego your branch meeting and we do a group huddle and I call it the two minute drill because I'm not like, do I believe that you need to have a process for underperformers? Yes, but I don't like the negativity that comes with that. So I call it the two minute drill, right? Because mm -hmm. think about a football game, um, a team's not doing so great. Um, they're trying to score quick before halftime or before the end of the game to catch up. And all of a sudden that two minute drill, the plays are more aggressive. They're more big play, they're more creative. So in that meeting, that's what we're trying to do. So I blast up their metrics on a big, those sticky pads that are like almost as tall as me. And I put all their names up there. And then for me, what I say is, okay, those of you that didn't hit this goal that we've set, like, let's dive into this. What do you think that is? And, and mm. they get to cuss and discuss and figure out with one another. So we're also, in a way, I'm kind of tricking them into doing my job for me. Where they're <laughs> right. Right. Well, own. you want them to coach themselves. Like that's, yeah. that's the dream, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, what's the saying, right? You have to figure out if you have a skill or a will problem, right? Mm -hmm. And so the last time we did this, we had two folks that kind of had a will problem that they were really trying to to make fun of men. They were trying to mansplain their way of why they weren't hitting what they were hitting. But then there were some people that were very honest and said, my problem is I have put so much wait time and effort into my top 10 accounts that I'm not putting any effort into the other 15 that I have assigned to me. I'm like, mm. there's your problem. I said, because if one of those guys gets pissed off, you could have had the replacement of his business. That's why you missed. And and I will get real analytical with him. I'll say, you know, let's just pick easy numbers for the sake. You sold $100,000 to 10 customers. That means you averaged 10. You said your goal and the goal we set together was 250,000. So by my logic, if we don't do any better with those 10 accounts, we need to add 15 accounts to your book of business. And, and we're using, I'm using simple logic to make them come to the conclusion on their own that you need to have you have the skill. Now I need mm -hmm. you to have the will to go and make this happen. But as far as what you were saying, Trey, like, uh, how do I decide? Well, I'm a little bit insane. I wake up at 4 a.m. every day. I go to the gym. And as I'm driving to the gym, um, I actually have like daily reporting so I can see where people are selling, where they're projected for the month. And I can see if they're really going to hit those targets. And those are the people, hey, 
let me, you know, you mentioned last week in the sales meeting, you're struggling with these three customers. Let's get a meeting together. Let's just see if I hear something you don't hear. I'm not mm. there. To, I'm not there to close it. I just want to see if maybe I can ask a question or two and you tell me what you think. And, and we've had success with that. And it's not, again, it's not because I'm trying to be Michael Jordan and make the game winner. It's I'm actually trying to pass the ball and make them realize they had an open shot. They weren't taking it. The yeah. customer was telling them, this has been my struggle with your company, or this has been my struggle with distribution. And boom, let's provide a solution. But we don't provide that until we know, you know, yep. and they get, you know, but again, I, I get it. I was there. I did it for five and a half years here. I, I'm sure there's a lot of customers that if they listen to this, they'll laugh. I'm like, dude, trust me, an idiot, you know, and I probably <laughs> won't, but I never said no, and I would always find an answer. So. <laughs> You know, the last thing I want to touch on, as you mentioned earlier, that you worked, uh, did Southwest, Southwestern, is that what it is? Or Southwest, Southwestern, South, Advantage. Yeah. Southwestern Advantage. So you're one of the unique people that has but, done both door-to-door fields, like B, what I call B2C field sales yeah. and B2B field sales. Yes. Like that's, you know, in Spotio, our customers fall into one of those two categories. And so sure. what did you, like, what did you learn? Did you do Southwestern for that learning experience? Of course, there's an opportunity to make money, but like, I'd love to hear what you took away from that and then how it has helped you uh, grow. If you ask my mom, she hated it because, you know, again, I have a lot of respect and I will never say a bad word about Southwestern Advantage, but, you know, you kind of are told that it's a sales internship with really good opportunity. You get to relocate, which when you're single and in college, it sounds amazing. Um, You're not. And again, maybe their approach is different, but when I was there, I was like, this is awesome. Like, selling experience, real commission. I get to learn how to run my own business. And I did learn those things. Mm -hmm. Um, I actually got relocated to um, a a small town called Zanesville, Ohio. So about two hours. Sounds awesome. Of Columbus. And then I worked, I mean, like there was days that I actually drove into West Virginia. So my door to door was a little bit more like I had to drive. I was working. Mm. There were a few small townships and cities that have like 15,000 people. So I could just park at the sheriff's office and then go knock. Um, but I mean, again, yeah, at that time, I'll be honest with you. I was really looking for money. Um, cause I, I paid my way through Texas A&M. So mm. it's really expensive and it's only costing more, unfortunately, um, <laughs> luckily I'm done, but, uh, you know, I, I think what I really learned about myself was how much my attitude controls my opportunity. Um, mm-hmm. and I know that sounds really corny, but just a, a really quick story. I'll give a cliff notes on this. Um, I was, I was knocking doors. I wasn't having a really great day. I'd done a, you know, cause we had goals. Like, you know, if you knock a hundred, you want to do 30 demos. And of those 30 mm-hmm. demos, you can, if you can have five strong sales and like three weak, meaning like five are people that put money down, believe in the product three are they gave you an order, but they put no money down. So you might have to resell them when you go back. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was having a day where I probably had, a, you know, at this time I had definitely knocked the doors. Um, I was, like I said, I was in a rural area, um, probably well below what I would say that the median is for the state of Ohio. Um, so pretty, pretty rough area where like, I mean, there's people that are more worried about buying milk than buying $300 worth of books. Yeah. Um, and so anyway, with that being said, I, I, I knew I trusted my manager at that time. This guy, Ross, I love that guy. And I was like, all right, Ross, like, I, and we didn't have our phone. So in my head, I'm like, man, what would Ross tell me? What would Ross tell me? Like, just, it's no big deal, dude. They're going to buy. It's no big deal. It's no big deal. So I just, you know, I was literally saying that out loud as I was walking. I probably looked insane if someone were videotaping me. Um, but anyway, wrapping up the story, had knocked the doors, maybe had like three customers that day. They were all weak, um, no money down. So I, I walk up to a door um, that was listed on my follow-up because the wife was a little timid. And again, like I'm six foot three, you can't really tell. Um, so anyway, I was like, man, and I got Texas plates. Like I got yeah. a book bag and they don't know what's in that book bag. So anyway, I knocked the door as a follow-up. The husband answers the door and like, lo and behold, like probably I'm standing about 18 inches from my camera, which I laugh to this day about. I'm like, really? That's your choice of gun? Dude pulls out a revolver, which I'm like, dude, you don't have a nine? Like, are you serious? <laughs> and, but like, of course, it doesn't matter what it is. You're putting right. it in the chest. I'm not playing games anymore. And uh, he tells me to come in, which like at this point, I'm not in control of this situation. Whoa. So I go and sit down and he's like, what have you been trying to pedal with like? And again, he's like, I, we hear there's this black kid that's out here selling drugs. And I was like, no, sir. Like, if you allow me to reach into my bag, I'll show you. Like, I have a seller's permit, which like they didn't need a permit. But I, like I said, I went to the sheriff's office and told them what I was doing because I was like, you're going to get calls. Um, anyway, real fast wrapping up here. 
I I go to do that. He's like, I don't think so. And like then comes up and like puts the gun on my shoulder. And I'm like, okay. Uh, Whoa. I'm like, okay, I'm gonna very slowly put the bag on the table. You are free to open it. Like there's literally books in there. And he's like, books. So I sit on the table, he opens it up, and he's like, okay, well, give me a demo. Like, what is this? So I explain it to him. <laughs> uh, I I'm like, I mean, dude, I'm shaking. Like my hands are sweating. Like you can see the sweat on my hands. I'm scared shitless. Mm -hmm. And Anyway, he like tells me to F off and was like, you just should be. And then he tries to give me some advice to be careful. And of course, like I wanted to be a smart ass, but I didn't because he still had the gun. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, yes, sir. I like backed out the whole time staring at him, honestly, kind of tucking behind the wheel. I don't know what I'm going to do if he decides to open fire. Um, I go down about a half a mile because I'm like, you know what? Like, you know, my manager told me any attitude. Now, granted, he didn't tell me, like, if you get a gun pulled on, you should just call it a day. Mind you, it's like 8.30 at night in the summer. So it's pretty late to be door knocking. So I pull up to this house about 8.50. Uh, I see smoke in the backyard. I'm like, dude, they're barbecuing. I get out and I can hear kids splashing in the pool. I'm like, yes, like a customer. I knock the door. Probably one of them. I, I wish I remembered their names. Most friendly couple in the <laughs> world in this double wide in Ohio. I show them the books. They actually have kids like age four to like high school senior which we have books like sat prep kids books everything mm. i sit there i demo the product the dude grills me a burger and they buy the whole pack like oh, wow. a thousand bucks and he hands me cash i'm like dude so i i tell that story not because i encourage you to get a gun pulled on you it's quite terrifying but the reason why i brought up that 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 internship and again i told my mom the story she about cried because i'll be honest when I read <laughs> the story yes i will admit as a 23 year old somewhat of a grown man i cried telling my mom because i was still shaking when i left that last house and got my phone out of my glove box it was done for the day and it was 9 50 at night when i closed that sale wow and i tell that story because in that moment like again that's the scariest thing you can probably deal with is to have your gun pulled on you or to have your kids in danger or your wife or, or whatever right. but in that moment i had a decision and i know i sound insane to some of y'all listening but i had a decision i could pack my crap up i could just cry about it and it was like a thursday and not work friday saturday and just make the excuse but the reality is i was like dude my that one jaded guy who thought I was peddling drugs, this other guy, he got, whenever I was closing the sale, he's like, dude, I've met like three people in town that said there's this dude from Texas and we were just waiting for you to come because we heard you're friendly. We heard that you <laughs> have families in the area. I mean, and when I went back to deliver the books, like, dude, the wife had like baked me a cake. And that <laughs> wasn't very good because I'm, yeah. I'm more of a chocolate cake guy. And I think it was <laughs> but the point I'm making is like, in all of that we've talked about in the last like half hour or so the attitude goes into everything i talked about it in hiring i talked about it with top performers those of you that are sales leaders or managers the, the attitude in which you take because rather it's someone on your team it's a customer whoever it is they give you this negative vibe i, I don't care if it takes five minutes i've told people on team sit in your car i don't know listen to a motivational video pray just sit in silence, do whatever recharges your brain and then mm -hmm. get back right after it. Because in that moment, you have a decision. You can dwell on that crap or you can use that to level up and move on to the next opportunity. Because in those times of weakness, like I said, when you're against the rings and you're taking punches in the face and you're taking punches in the gut, you have a decision. Do you want to sit on the ropes and cry about it? Or do you want to come out swinging and, and make it happen? So um, yeah. again, Fred, that story is a little long, but it's- Love it's, that it's, story. I love telling that story. Uh, that's a so good yeah, one. I learned a lot from that. And um, yeah, that's how I got into sales. I'm like, well, the contractor ain't going to pull a gun on me. He knows yeah, yeah. he might <laughs> yeah. say that off, but like he ain't going to shoot me. No revolvers. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, was, I was still laugh at that. About that so. Travis, this has been awesome time. Thank you so much for sharing your story, your history, how you've gotten to where you're at. I feel motivated. I'm excited. And I know the listeners are too. How can they connect with you? Is is there a, are you on LinkedIn? Is there a way that if, if someone wants to connect with you, they can? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, my social media is just stuff on my kids, but yeah, I'm really active on LinkedIn. Again, Travis Flores. Uh, it looks like Flores, but it's F-L-O-O-R-E-S. Um, I'm connected there. Facebook, I'll add. I said it wrong at the intro. Apologize about that. No, no, you're good. You're good. I just like to tell people, they're like, man, is he Hispanic? I'm like, no, no. Uh, <laughs> tricky with the last name, but yeah. <laughs> Facebook, LinkedIn, super active there. Talk a lot about SRS. Um, my cell's 469-724-0077. I always call back. I always text back. So please um, reach out to me. I, I just love helping others, um, even outside the business. So 
Um, would love to connect. Thank you so much, Trey, for having me and the Spotio team. I had a great time and hopefully it's one of many. Thanks, Travis. Appreciate it. Yes, sir. You've just listened to the Inside Scoop on Outside Sales Podcast with your host, Trey Gibson. Please feel free to leave us a review and subscribe to our channel so you can catch our next episode. Thank you for listening.